today's a day of learning, and hopefully sort of I'll be able to sort of share some experiences with you. Um, Right, so my background, I work in a general mixed intensive care. There's predominantly medicine now, it used to be surgery. You have 900 discharges a year from the intensive care. <clears throat> you have 12 nurses and 15 bed spaces. So this is a level two, level three combination. Um, the average age is 61, 60% of males. This is the ICU population I know from McNark in the country. Uh, we have a very small bed base uh, for our population in Reading. Uh, we have something on our, we, we computerise on our, we have a, an out of unit activity. So outside the ICU, we see about 3,000 patients a year, the ICU. And then we have a 24 7 outreach service, and they see 10,000 patients a year. Um, SMR is one, whatever that means. And then we have a sort of a 5% uh, uh, death rate post intensive care. This is a little bit lower than national average. I'm just bringing this up so it just gives you a bit of an idea of your hospital compared to mine um, uh, for, for what it's worth. So we got ASV in 2008 uh, through Hamilton. Uh, we started using the PV tool in 2009 uh, and in Televent in 2012. It was actually a democratic vote. We went through the procurement process. Um, the ventilator company came in every day and they showed us the machine and Everyone in the department sort of scored it, and the Hamilton came out uh, top with another company. They were cheaper, so we went for them. And I just like thank goodness we came across them because they got very, very um, innovative uh, uh, software actually. And we'll sort of try and show you some of this today. Uh, I went to the clinical. They, they do teaching sessions in in Switzerland. I went there in 2008, uh, and I've been a trainer since 2013. So it's brilliant. So I get to go to Switzerland. I meet intensivists from all over the world. And we hear all the different problems they're getting and whatnot. It's very, 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 very stimulating for me. So what's this, what's this first talk about? I sound Irish up there, don't I? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I want to go through minute volume and how important this is. Um, I often think that people don't really focus on this very much. Um, I'm going to sort of talk about the forces the ventilator has to overcome on the patient. Uh, what we should look for on a, on a patient who will be ventilating and then what ASV gives us uh, in addition. So how the body works. So essentially this is how everything functions. Oxygen <coughs> attaches to glucose and then we produce CO2 and water. And from this we get energy. Okay? This is the basis of our existence. I mean, the energy allows us to move, control homeostasis, etc. and whatnot. <coughs> And the way you get oxygen and CO2 and out is your minute volume. Okay? This is why it's so important. Obviously, if you're critically ill and you don't have enough glucose, etc., this pathway. But this is a vast, vast way you get the vast majority of the way you get energy. So minute volume, if I'm asleep, my minute volume will be very low. I don't need much energy. And I can do this for hours and hours. If I then go for a run, so do a half marathon. I can manage it, my minute volume goes right up, but I can't do it forever. I'll fall over quite quickly. <clears throat> if you look at the intense care patient, if you're septic, the minute volume's high. Elective post-op, they've got no pain, etc. You don't actually vent have to ventilate them very much with a pretty low minute volume because the energy requirement is pretty low. And then I'm going to talk the, about the H equation. We always breathe at the most efficient way, depending on what our resistance and compliance is. We always breathe at the tidal volume and respiratory rate, uh, which is a, uses the least amount of energy. <clears throat> I'm just going to go through so minute volume changes. So this is tidal volume down the side here and respiratory rate. <sighs> Sorry, this is a bit of a pain. It's behind me. So this here just gives you a person's minute volume. So. Depending on what the lung mechanics are, this will be your tidal volume, that will be your respiratory rate. <clears throat> when I'm asleep, my, when I'm asleep, my minute volume goes down. So my um, respiratory rate and tidal volume will go down. Yep. And then when I go off on my half marathon run, it goes right up here. My tidal volume, my respiratory rate goes up. 
But if something changes my lung mechanics, here, my refrigerator and my tidal volume might change. Now that might be, I might be lying down, I might have a weight on my tummy, I might be pregnant, whatever. These things will all change. And what it'll mean is my respiratory and tidal volume uh, will alter. And we do this all the time. This is what, so depending on our position, what we're doing, our respiratory rate and tidal volume will change. And the expiratory time constant will tell you, tell you what this is. And I'll go through this in a bit more, more detail a bit later. So forces to overcome. So if you just take us all sitting in here, our breathing muscles, the two things I have to overcome is the elastic recoil of the chest wall and the lungs, and then the resistant forces, so the airflow, so the ET tube and the, and the airways. So chest wall, lungs, airways, and then the ET tube. So what happens, so for example, you get a pneumonia, the lung gets very, very congested. So this value goes up, so your work of breathing goes up. We see this, don't we? Patients with spiritual rate goes up, etc. cetera, and whatnot. Then what we do is we come along and we add in the ventilator or the non-invasive. And by adding this in, this balances it out. Yeah? Some of the problems we face is we essentially have one button on the ventilator. There's a few more, but you only have two or three pressures. There's three million alveoli. Roughly. I don't, know, I don't know who's ever counted these, but there's a lot anyway. And the pressure reading that we get gives us the, the pressure across the lungs and the chest wall. So in this, circum this situation here, the pressure across the lungs is not so bad. In this situation here, the pressure across the lungs is a lot higher. Yep. So the esophageal pressure monitor will tell you, will be able to sort of uh, tell you which is which. But for the last year to the time, we sort of stuck on the ventilator. We don't know which, whether it's chest wall or lung causing problems. And then the other thing, which is sort of common, and I've only sort of changed this over the last few years, is when we come to put someone on a ventilator, what we tend to do is focus, there's a huge focus on the tidal volume. So we come along and we say, right, I want a tidal volume of seven mils per kg. I'll use a pressure mode or a volume mode. Um, I'll then choose a rate, um, i.e. ratio most of the times, one to two, and that gives you the minute volume. The minute volume tends not to be, people don't pay much attention to this, um, sort of certainly what, I, what I've seen over the years. You perhaps look at the blood gas a little bit later, and uh, then depending on what the blood gas is, you then alter the, the tidal volume and the respiratory rate. So maybe we should perhaps focus on the minute volume. I said how important it is. So real rough rule of thumb, 100 mils per kg of your predicted body weight. Yep. So most males in this country are 70 kgs. Most females are 60 kgs. This is the ideal weight, yeah? You then, again, focus on tidal volume. This is important, especially if you've got um, sort of ARDS. This is 7 mils per kg. And then you know the two factors. So if you know minute volume and tidal volume, respiratory rate is automatically calculated. So, for example, if we take a 70 kilogram person, remember I said 100 mils per kg, so I'll have a minute volume of 7,000 mils. This is seven liters. Yeah. You then say you want a tidal volume of seven mils per kg. I'm just doing this to make the maths easy. You might want six mils per kg. So seven sevens are 49, roughly 500. Do you know these two values? So your switch rate is 14. This is how you start, start off setting some up on a ventilator. And this is what we treat, uh, teach in-house at, at our place, uh, for what it's worth. So this first talk was sort of a little bit of introduction. I just try to sort of think of different ways, how important minute volume is, perhaps how we focus on there, how the minute volume changes. So when you've got someone to wean, pathological process, if you don't fix this, I think you're in trouble. You've got to work out the metabolic demands of the patients. Um, because again, if somebody's got a high metabolic demand, you have to ventilate them harder, which potentially causes more lung damage. The lung mechanics, the experience time constant will give you this, and I'll go through this in my next talk. And it actually tells you what's wrong, uh, whether it's chest wall, whether it's uh, uh, airways. And we've got to ensure there's no lung damage. That's ultimately what you're trying to achieve. 
uh, and then essentially delta P, high tidal volume, these are the two things which sort of, and the peak pressure will tell us whether we're causing lung damage or not. So just to re reiterate, amount of volume at rest. Um, the ASV button, we all know if you 100% amount of volume, that means 100 mils per kg. The time, the respiratory rate is determined by the time constant. You know those two, uh, the tidal volume is automatically adjusted. How we breathe normally, so how are we sitting here now? So the minute volume we decide ourselves. Yep. The respiratory rate is decided by our lung mechanics, how we're sitting, whether you've got a tight jacket on or not, whether you've got a bit of asthma. And then the tidal volume is determined by the above two. Tidal volume is a little bit affected by how strong your muscles are as well. Obviously, if you're very tired, you're not going to be able to generate the tidal volume you want. This formula here, sorry to go on and on about it. <coughs> and then what you want on a ventilator, if your lung mechanics change and your minute volume is the same, you want to move up and down. <coughs> this is what we have on our ventilators in the ICU. This gives you most, most of this will tell you the information you need. So your peak pressure, your end tidal CO2, it tells you the tubes in place. We express our tidal volume in mils per kg. We don't bother with ab absolute volumes. Um, it's just easier and we don't get confused with maths. The minute volume is very important. Again, if this is high, this is a problem. And then your time constant. And then saturations. And most of this gives you, for most of our patients, the type of ICO I work in. This tells you all you need to know. This is a 78-year-old female with pneumonia, previously well. This is just a patient who was in the ICU last week. So this is 24 hours down here. So what we've done over the last 24 hours, we've trended a minute volume. OK, so the top line is 8. This line will be 4 here. So her minute volume has been running at about 7. OK, she's sedated under remifentanil. She's not breathing for herself. The peak pressure, or the delta P, so the next graph down. So this line is 30. This line in the middle is 15. OK, so I see her peak pressures between 15 and 20. This is OK. The delta P, this is the difference between the peep and the peak. Again, this doesn't look too bad. So the peep's running about 7 or 8 uh, peak pressure. So I'm, I'm running about 12 to 15. The experience time constant, this is normal, 0.6 to 0.8 seconds. So this line here is 0.6. So she's just slightly below normal. So her lung mechanics aren't, aren't bad. And then just to finish off, her tidal volume, I know this has to be safe. So this line here is 10 mils per kg. This line here will be 5. So for the last 24 hours, her tidal volume has been constant at about 6 mils per kg, which is what we want. Yep. And it just shows you a typical patient in the ICU. This is how we treat them. Some of the other things we look at. So this is a screenshot from our computerized system. This is another patient. So peak pressure, 23, 24. The patient's on 21% oxygen. Uh, so you look at those pressures, you don't think this is too bad. Tidal volume, yeah, we can accept this. This is OK. One of the problems, though, is our delta P is sort of, sort of about 20. And the peep's only 5. And what you can see on here, is this time constant is OK with this time constant? This suggests the lungs are a little bit stiff. So maybe the lungs are collapsed down. Maybe you have to go along and do a PV tool, inflate it again. And maybe this way you'll get the delta P down. <clears throat> so how to wean? ASV start to finish. This is what we do uh, in our place. Um, uh, it allows automatic adjustments, which, uh, which cha changes over time. And the patients I've just shown you, you can see this. Um, it shows us the lung mechanics uh, and hopefully it prevents any damage. <clears throat>